Chapter Six of the Mystery of Pain, recording by Ethan D. Gilkey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. We can return now to the subject which forms the foundation of the thoughts that have been expressed, namely the redemption of man. If we recognize a want in our nature, a condition like that of a disease making us feel pain in that which should be joyful, we feel at once that we have need of a deliverance, need of a cure. And seeing that this condition of want or disease affects not individuals only, but the whole human race, we feel that man needs a restoration, a perfecting of his life. Man's nature, appearing as diseased, claims a restorer. Appearing as a victim of a perverted feeling, which subjects it to evil, it needs to be redeemed from this. Now this is the thought to which reference has been made in the idea of the redemption of the world, that redemption is the raising up of man from the evil condition in which he feels sacrifice as pain, to a condition in which it is felt as joy, a condition of true and perfect life. Thus the idea stands in a definite light before us, this is the change which man's nature needs. This is the change which it is receiving. The redemption of man, as I have spoken or shall speak of it here, means this change. A change not only of his feelings and will, but of his actual state. I seek to regard our experience in its relation to this work. In the part which they bear in it, I find the glory of our pains and the consolation of our griefs. For if this work is being done, it is necessarily being done in all human experience, or rather, this experience of ours is the very work itself. Strange and unlike as they may appear, these events which bring us joy or sorrow, perplexity or pleasure, gain or loss, these things in which we are actively engaged, or which are passively inflicted on us, these are carrying out the work in man so that we may take each of our pains and sorrows and say, man's redemption is so carried out in this, is effected through it, demands this to be. It is no matter that it is so disconnected, so useless, so utterly insignificant. Nothing is discounted. Nothing that moves man's spirit and rouses his capacity of feeling is insignificant. Nothing that is linked, as all events are linked inseparably into the great history of man is useless if man's redemption is a fact it is the fact of these experiences that may seem so small and objectless the unseen fact of them they seeming small only because it is unseen the evidence that this work is accomplished is drawn of course from the declarations of scripture which affirm a salvation bestowed on man and to be wrought in him which promise that he shall be made alive in christ and receive an eternal life and here i may briefly say that to my own mind the language of the new testament appears unequivocally to affirm the redemption of all men their actual redemption from this evil and diseased state in which we now are the actual raising up of all to a perfect life to my own mind this universality seems to be clearly expressed in scripture and to give an unutterable delight to life but it is not necessary that this should be believed in order for us to receive the happiness which knowledge that our sufferings serve their part in the great work of redemption gives that happiness may still rest upon serving the good of others though not all may share that good in the words before quoted st paul says I fill up that which is behind me of the afflictions of Christ for his body's sake, which is the church. He does not say in this passage, as in so many others he at least appears to say, that the sphere of Christ's church shall finally include the whole human race. And the happiness which flows from this thought may be shared by those who can believe it true of their own sufferings, even though they think that those on whose behalf God uses them are but a part and not the whole of men. On this point I may venture one remark. It seems to me that great difficulties have been rightly felt in recognizing in the language of Scripture 
any clear assertion that all men shall be brought to Christ and spiritually made alive through him. There is much which, with thoughts such as ours have been, seems very expressly to affirm the contrary. But it appears to me that a chief source of these difficulties has been our own corruption. As we are now, we feel, we cannot help feeling, that of the two evils, pain and sin, pain, if it be extreme, is greater. By nature we fear suffering more than sinning. Now, reading the New Testament with this feeling operating in our thoughts, as we are sure to do unless we are expressly on our guard against it, we can hardly fail to misunderstand its language and to think of suffering or loss where it speaks of sin. So reading it, we may well see in its words mere hopeless ruin as the destiny of a large part of men. But if we keep watch over ourselves here, and remember that only he whose very life is death can feel suffering worse than sin, or could speak as if it were, if we remember that God's chief warnings, therefore, must be against not what we fear most, but against that which, perhaps, we do not fear at all, the words of the New Testament present themselves to us in a new light, and the apparent meaning of many passages that we may easily recall which speak as if Christ's kingdom were to embrace each member of the human race, telling us that he will draw all men to him, that every knee shall bow in his name, that God shall be all in all. The apparent meaning of these passages may grow clear to our purged eyes as the true burden of the gospel. We may be able, giving an awful force to its threatenings, to take to our gladdened hearts, our hearts made warm with new life, its large and joyful words, which speak a salvation achieved for all, in all to be fulfilled, a salvation of which one chief and essential part consists in the very remedy of this perverted feeling. For when man finds only joy in sacrifice, there can no more be any evil felt by him as worse than sin. Sin, indeed, would stand as the one sole evil felt or capable of being felt by him, and in this would not his redemption be fulfilled? But while the belief that a redemption, a new creation of his nature, is being worked out in man, rests primarily and essentially on the New Testament, yet it has other evidences which may well add strength to our conviction. True, it is a work that is unseen, a fact that cannot be made visible to the eye of the sense, a fact which, save for its revelation in Christ, could not have been discovered. Yet evidences of it may be found in many facts. Surely in the very constitution of our nature, made as it is for sacrifice, constructed to find its chief joy only there, feeling, even in its degradation, that no other joys are fully worthy of it, proof is given that man is designed and destined for a life proportioned to his powers. And do not the very pain and loss by which man is surrounded, if we read them rightly, testify to the same thing? Not accidentally, not arbitrarily, do these assail him. They are rooted in the essential conditions of his being. They are inseparable from the structure of the world and the relation which he bears to it. The individual must be sacrificed and suffer loss. It is his inevitable lot. The total order of nature must be altered ere he could escape it. The necessity for sacrifice is built into the structure of our being. It is the birthright, the inalienable inheritance of life. What then can we say but that it foretells and promises a state of being and a mode of life to which it shall not be alien and hostile, a life in which it shall exist as a kindred and friendly element, and to the fullness of which it shall be minister, as we know it may be. Must not the inevitable existence of pain and loss to us mean this? And human history, when it is closely scanned, confirms this thought. Dark and unmeaning as it looks, this at least is visible in it, that without sacrifice no permanent satisfaction or truly good result is suffered to be attained. Incessantly man aims at ends which do not involve self-abandonment. Incessantly they are denied to him, or when gained, deceive his hope. Satisfaction is withheld, the best-founded hopes prove vain, the highest powers fail, 
experiments on which the brightest expectations have been founded fall in ruin no lesser end suffices but by failure and discontent man is driven ever onward if we ask ourselves to what goal can we not foresee the answer he is driven onward to this to accept loving sacrifice as his good these facts are evident in human life even as it is that man is framed for joy and sacrifice that until it can be made his joy sacrifice must be his torment for it never can be banished that without the willing acceptance of sacrifice no end is really answered in human life no satisfaction that is worthy of humanity achieved add to these things the known fact that our nature is imperfect and the promise given to its renovation and does not their meaning become manifest that man's redemption is the end for which this present human life exists the unseen end which it achieves end of chapter six of the mystery of pain recording by ethan d gilkey